this video, we're going to continue exploring the difference of two means. I'm going to show you how to use SDA to generate the information you need to calculate a difference of means test by hand. Then we're going to push on and look at how to use confidence intervals to understand difference of means tests. And finally, I'm going to show you some computer output generated by Stata using a difference of means test to show you what a statistical software application produces and how to interpret that particular output. Let's start by looking at an example. On this page, I'm showing you a frequency distribution of a, of a variable called news. And this asks people how frequently do they read a newspaper. The options are every day, a few times a week, once a week, less than once a week, or never. Notice that those are coded from 1 to 5, where 1 means that you read a newspaper every day, and 5 means you never read a newspaper. So we need to be careful in interpreting this statistic any statistics generated by this because larger values will mean reading the newspaper less frequently. Over on the right hand side I've generated using SDA the means, standard deviations, and number of cases for how frequently people read the newspaper by gender. You can see the average for men is 2.08 and the average for women is 2.26. This means that men read the newspaper on average more frequently than women and we're interested in whether this difference is statistically significant. Let's take a quick break here and let's run over to SDA and I'll show you where I got these numbers. So here we are in SDA at the default page. This is the page I would go to if I wanted to look at the univariate frequency distribution of our variables. But I want to, I want to generate the means, standard deviations, and sample sizes of the news variable by gender. So I need to go up here to analysis and do a comparison of means. My dependent variable, when I type in this cell it's going to bring up my old variables. I've used these before. You'll have to type those in by hand. My row variable is sex. My selection filter, I'm going to do this for 1998. I want to make certain to take no weights. Now down here I want to make certain that I'm getting the right statistics in each cell. I'm not going to take the standard error, but I want to make certain to get the standard deviation and the sample size. I think I've made the correct, correct, correct selections there. A bar chart seems fine, and I think we're ready to go ahead and run the table. I'm just going to come up here into News and click Enter. You can see here that men read the newspaper on average 2.08, women 2.26, and I have my standard deviations and sample size. Here I have my bar chart. You can see the difference between men and women. It doesn't appear to be a very large difference, but we're asking the question, is this difference statistically significant? I'm going to set my null hypothesis to be mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 is equal to 0. That is, men minus women is equal to 0. They have the same average. My alternative hypothesis is that mu sub 1 minus mu sub 0 is not equal to 0. So you can tell that I'm using a two-tailed test. I have a large sample size, 811 men, 1,059 women, and therefore I know I can use with alpha 0.05 a t statistic of 1.96 as my critical value. If I had a small sample size, I would definitely need to go to the table in the back of the book or some other t table to look up the appropriate t value, and it would be larger than 1.96. Again, with these six numbers, it's pretty easy to calculate the difference of means test by hand. We know that the difference of means test is simply uh, the difference of the two means divided by the pooled standard error, and the formula for the pooled standard error is given in the uh, top of this slide. Plugging the numbers in, I get a value of 2.98. That is to say that the difference in newspaper reading, men compared to women, is when converted to a T statistic is 2.98, which clearly exceeds 1.96 and therefore I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. I may have made an error here, and the error could be that I have rejected the null when I shouldn't have. I found a difference that doesn't actually exist. The probability of making that error, which is a type 1 error, is 0 0.05, and that's, that's controlled or dictated by my alpha value, which I get to select as the researcher. This begs the question of whether this difference, which looks to be pretty small, is substantively important. And that's a topic we'll have to take up a bit later. Let's look at this problem from a slightly different perspective to help us understand the difference of means test. 
If I take the average of men and put a 95% confidence interval around it, and the average for women and put a 95% confidence interval around that parameter estimate, then those two intervals should not overlap if there is a statistically significant difference between the average frequency that men and women read newspapers. You can see that these bars do not overlap. That is, the upper limit of the men and the lower limit of the women, there's a gap between them, indicating that these 95% confidence intervals don't overlap. If the relationship was not statistically significantly different, if the null hypothesis was true, then we would expect these two confidence intervals to overlap somewhat, and we would fail to reject the null. Now I need to add a caveat here. This doesn't always work, and this is not really great statistical practice. I'm just showing you this to make a point. Well, why isn't this great practice? Well, you'll notice that for the men, I'm, con I'm calculating my confidence interval on the based on a sample size of 811. And for the women, I'm basing my confidence interval on a sample size of 1,059. Now, these are both very large samples, but we're often confronted with research problems where we have much smaller samples. And you know that when we get somewhere between 30 and 60, that our t-statistics increase and our errors and our estimates become, we have less confidence in our estimates. When we calculate a true difference of means test, we're pooling these two sample sizes together to produce one estimate of the standard error. Here we're producing two. And so it happens that our estimates for the standard error are better when we pool our two samples than when we separate them. So we won't always come to the same conclusion by putting confidence intervals around single sample means. But I'm showing you this just to demonstrate how the difference of means test works logically. Here's our last example. Here we're using county level data with a sample of counties divided into northern and southern counties and we're going to compare average per capita income across these two regions. This output, all these numbers, was generated by a statistical software application called Stata. This is a very typical kind of output and the kind of thing you'll be doing in your next methods or statistics class. There's a lot of numbers here but really there's not a lot going on. The first thing I would look at when I look at this kind of output is I would look at the two different means. We can see that the mean for the north is $33,092.65. Again, I'm going to start rounding these numbers because the notion of having um, county level per capita income accurate to the penny is really not correct. Uh, we know that these are estimates at best. In the south, the average income is $25,541.52. I would then look at the difference between these two regions of the country. Looking down that column labeled mean, the last number is 7,551, and that indicates the difference between the average per capita income in the north and the south. And our statistical question is, is that difference statistically significant? The next piece of information I would look at is the t-statistic. It's calculated for us. We don't need the formula. We understand that the for that formula is being used to calculate this t-statistic, but the computer does the work for us. And here we get a t-statistic of 15.8, 15.9. That's a very large t-statistic under just about any circumstance, and particularly with a large sample size, where my combined sample size is over 1,500. I know that if I have alpha 0.05, that I need to exceed 1.96 or minus 1.96 and obviously 15.9 satisfies that. So I would reject the null hypothesis here. The other numbers in the table might be useful to you and we can go back and look at them now. For example, looking at the north, we see that there's 217 observations, 217 counties. We get the average, which is about $33,092. We get the standard error. This is the same standard error that we learned how to calculate earlier for single sample means. We're given the standard deviation of the per capita income, and we get a 95% confidence interval. We get the same information for the South, the same information for the North and South combined, that is ignoring our independent variable, and finally we get the same statistics for the difference. We get another piece of information that involves a new concept at the bottom of this table. 
you'll notice that there is a null hypothesis given. That's data new enough to put together a null hypothesis, which is that DIFF equals zero, where DIFF is equal to the mean of the north, north minus the mean of the south. Our null hypothesis, then, is that the difference between the north and south equals zero. Below that, I'm given three alternative hypotheses. HA, so that's another way of saying alternative hypothesis, is that the difference is less than zero. HA, that the difference is greater than zero. And finally, the one in the middle, HA, that the difference is not equal to zero. And you have to know a little bit about Stata to know that exclamation mark equals means not equals. That is, the exclamation mark in Stata is not. Underneath that, we get three values. These are called the p-values. This is a difficult concept to get at first, but it turns out to be very useful. A p-value is the probability, or it's the area under a t-distribution, or under any sampling distribution, that falls to the right of the statistic you calculated. In this particular problem, we calculated a t-statistic of about 15.9. You can see on the diagram at the bottom, I have that, that t distribution go from minus 5 to 5. And so you can see that 15 is way off the chart. And yet, it's a possible outcome. If I were to draw a line at 15 and measure the area or the probability of getting a value of 15.9 or greater, it would be a shaded area in the far right tail exceeding 15.9. I can't show it on this diagram because this difference is very large. The p-value is the probability, the area under the curve, greater than 15.9. Now you'll notice in the middle p-value, where the difference is not equal to 0, we get a p-value of 0 0.0000. It doesn't mean that the p-value is actually 0. It's some number. But typically, our critical values here are 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. And if we were to get a p-value, smaller than 0 0.001, we would reject the null hypothesis. So instead of reporting 5 or 10 or 12 digits, we're only going to report 4 because, again, our critical values, alpha 0 0.052 tail, plus or minus 1.96, alpha 0 0.01 are, are with a t statistic of 2.58, and alpha 0 0.001 with a t statistic of 3.3, assuming large samples, cut off 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001 of the tail of the distribution. So anytime we get small p-values, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. This is a concept we're going to come back to and use in a lot of different statistics. The nice thing about p-values are, instead of having to compare a t-statistic to a t-critical, some t-statistic that we calculate to a t-statistic from the back of the book, and then maybe doing the same thing with an f-statistic, and then with another kind of, then with a z statistic, we can convert everything to these probabilities, and every statistical test will provide a p value, and we can simply compare the, t the p value to, some to our alpha value.